I expect you've had times in your life where you felt you knew what God's will was and you stepped out to do it and almost immediately walls started springing up. No, wait, stop, can't. And you think, I, I, I was sure this is what God wanted me to do. What's wrong? Am I that blind? Well, actually, biblically, as well as in your experience, that's pretty much what happened. God tells Abraham, you're going to have a son. Now? No, not now. Just wait. You're going to have a son. Okay, here he is. He's, he's my maid's son. No, that's not him. What? What? You told me I was going to have a son. I have a son. What? Why is it? Moses, go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Let my people go. No. What? I'm doing God's will. How come it's not working? Well, obviously, because God is unfaithful and a liar. You know, in church you say that and everybody goes, Oh, no. But in fact, in your experience, when that happens, that is your first thing. Either I'm doing it wrong or God's stringing me along. He's kidding me. What's going on here? I thought I was doing God's will and then God's smacking me around. Trusting God is hard. Even when you say, all right, I know what's going on. I know God's, uh, God told me to do this. I know that Moses had to do it and Abraham had to do it. Other people had to do it. I know that. And so I'm trusting God. And it's still hard. John chapter 4, beginning at verse 43. We'll just read 43, 44, and 45 to begin with. Now remember, the last part we looked at, Jesus was with the Samaritans in Samaria. Verse 43. After the two days, he left for Galilee. Now, Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They'd seen all that he had done in Jerusalem and at the Passover festival, for they also had been there. Let's pray. Father, I keep coming back to the question, do I trust you? Do I believe you? Is it just words or is it my life? Help us as we study this passage today, as your spirit opens it up to us, to learn better how to trust you, to see that we're not the Lone Ranger out there somewhere, but that we're part of your great family and that this is the way you work in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this looks like a parenthetical remark. Matter of fact, in my Bible, it is a parenthetical remark. After two days, he left for Galilee. Now, Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. But when he goes to Galilee, well, the Galileans, that's his country, they're happy to see him. Because they'd seen him in Jerusalem, they'd seen him at the Passover, they'd been there, it was all great. And so now he's coming back home, local boy does good. Well, let's take a look. It's two days, he'd been in Samaria for two days, stayed there, and that was the last passage we looked at told us that. But now it's time to move on. You know, the Apostle Paul, in his ministry of 40-some years, he often spent years ministering to a church and leading the pastors and preparing them and other pastors in the area. He had time to establish local churches. Jesus only had a three-year ministry. He did not have time to stay everywhere. He had to move on. He was constantly going. He had to cover as much ground as possible. And when you look at, you know, I've heard people say, yeah, Jesus never went more than 100 miles from his hometown. That's probably true, but in fact, that's still a lot of ground to cover. It's still a lot of people to meet. That's still a lot of things to do. And so Jesus had to keep moving. And he pointed out, probably did it more than once, which is why it's here, 
a prophet is without honor in his own country. Now, what does that mean? It means that, well, it's another way of saying familiarity breeds contempt. If you, if you grew up with someone and they suddenly become a big shot, you're like, who do they think they are? Too big for their bridges, that's what it is. It's like Joseph and his brother. Oh, I dreamed that uh, we were all gathering sheaves and my sheep stood up and all of your sheaves bowed down to it. Well, who do you think you are, Junior? Special, huh? The Samaritans had begged Jesus to stay. And this may be why this parenthetical comment is right here. The Samaritans had begged him to stay, but after two days he had to move on. The prophet has no honor in his own country. Back in, in Nazareth, it was like, yeah, we know him. We grew up with him. He was, he's, he's married for us. Don't we know his brothers and sisters? No big deal. But the, the lesson there about a prophet is without honor in his own country is don't close your eyes, you might miss something. Don't be so sure of everything. Yeah, I know that guy. That God can't use that guy. Okay, something to think about. So, he goes back to Galilee, and Nazareth may have been unimpressed, but Galilee as a whole is thrilled to have Jesus there. A prophet from Galilee. He's not some big shot from Gamaliel's school down there in Jerusalem. No, he's one of our guys. Local boy makes good. Now, a person from the AV, you know, this is a small pond. It's not Los Angeles. It's a small pond. And you, somebody here can, you know, get pretty well known and and he's our local guy, and that's fine. But still, come on, ho-hum, we know him. He's just that person. She's just that girl. You know, everybody knows that. But let them show up on national TV, and suddenly we're all proud. It's just human nature. It's just human nature. So Jesus, here he is. He's a prophet. He's ministering. He's going. And a lot of people take him either, well, they take him at face value. Yeah, he's from, he's from Galilee, so what? Yeah, he's a prophet, so what? Yeah, he's this. Look beyond, how do I want to say this? Fine. I am a minister. I'm licensed. I'm ordained. I've been to Bible college, like half a year. I've been to seminary. <laughs> Fine, I'm a minister. You know, run of the mill, who cares, so what? A lot of stuff I say is donology. And you can just let that go. You can laugh at it or or whatever you want to do with it. But perhaps when I'm speaking, especially God's Word, maybe perhaps something I'm speaking might be worth listening to because it's coming out of God's Word. And so, you know, yeah, we all know Don, yeah, so what? Don't look at me as the oracle of God, but realize that God has put me here in a leadership position to teach his word. I think that's, I think that's healthy. With, with Jesus, you can look at him and go, yeah, yeah, he's a good teacher, he's a good man. But if that's all you're going to do, you're going to miss out on a lot of stuff. He's got more than that. So here he is, he comes back to Galilee, and look at verse 46. Once more, he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told them, you'll never believe. The royal official said, Sir, Come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied. Your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word. 
and departed. Now there's a lot of power in those few sentences. Because it just looks like another occasion. Somebody needed some healing. Yeah, here's some healing. Okay, fine. Amen. So there's a lot going on here. Let's start with the royal official. Sounds mysterious. A royal official. Who was this royal official? Well, the summons comes from, and the son is sick, in the city of Capernaum. Herod had a palace in Capernaum. So it's quite likely, when we talk about a royal official, we're talking about someone on the Jewish side rather than the Roman side. Uh, and so it's probably a member of Herod's household. It doesn't have to be Herod's son or a direct blood relative. It can be anybody serving in Herod's household. You would think of them, if, if somebody from the DMV came and talked to you, you wouldn't think, oh, they're the, they're, because they're not the governor, they're not you know, official. If they're, if they're a minor dog catcher official, they're still a government official. So <clears throat> that's what we have here. We actually have two options named in the New Testament that I think might fit here. Did I give those to you, Ruth? Okay, so verse uh, Luke 8, 3. And there we go. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household, and uh, Susanna and many others. So Joanna, Chusa is Herod's steward, is Meyer Domo. And uh, so perhaps it's, it's Chusa who is the royal official. Don't know, but it's a possibility. There's another one in Acts chapter 13, verse 1. We have another person mentioned, and now uh, the church at Antioch tried to reach with his branches. There were <laughs> prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Manan is probably, in the way that description is, a half brother of Herod. Raised, brought up with, means he was raised with him. And so Manan is possibly another person that this could have been. Do I know any more beyond those two verses? No. No, they're just two names that are possibilities. Could have been someone else completely. Don't know. But the reason those people are named, especially <clears throat> because Joanna is a believer. She's his wife, is a believer. Manan shows up in the book of Acts as a believer. And so it's possible that that belief started back there during the Jesus, during Jesus' ministry. So this royal official doesn't send a servant, goes to Cana himself. Now, I'm sorry to say I didn't look at a map to find out how far it is from Capernaum to Cana, but I would, off the top of my head, I'm going to guess it's between 40 and 60 miles. Any idea, Robin? No. Because Capernaum is at the north end of the Sea of Galilee, and Cana is south of the Sea of Galilee. So it's it's quite a trip. It's, I mean, it's not an overnighter. It's something you've got to do. So he, this royal official comes all the way from Capernaum to talk to Jesus and beg him to heal his son. And what does Jesus do? Oh, you poor man. I know you must be hurting. Unless you people see signs, you'll not believe. Thank you. That, now I'm in church. Thank you, Lord. But perhaps, perhaps the only reason this royal official came, if it was Chusa, for instance, is because his wife nagged him to go to Jesus. And that's the only reason he went. He really didn't believe himself. But yeah, okay, I'll go. I'll go. I'll go. Stop. And so... Jesus is challenging him where he is, and apparently where he is is he doesn't really believe. But his challenge kind of shakes him up. Must you have a sign before you'll believe? Think about it. Faith is trusting, believing God, no matter your circumstances. Hebrews 11.6 tells us without faith, it's impossible to please God. The other scripture in, in uh, Corinthians, Paul says we walk by faith, not by sight. And that's great sitting here in church on a Sunday morning where we're all brothers and sisters 
and we're part of the team and we say amen. That's another thing, bless you. That's another thing when you're two days down a dusty road and your son is laying sick and dying and you have no hope. Trust God? Okay, I will, but what if? And isn't that the way most of life's problems hit you? God, I'm, it's like that guy, I do believe, help my unbelief. Because I trust you, God, but this is my son. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if you don't have any faith, God hates you and you're going to hell. Be careful. What it's saying is, and you'll see this theme throughout all of Scripture. I think the original sin is not eating the apple or whatever the fruit was. I think the original sin is unbelief. It's lack of faith. Oh, you're not surely going to die. God wouldn't do that to you. I don't believe it, so I'm going to do what I want to do. And all through Scripture, you see this theme. I don't believe God, so I'm going to... I'm going to take steps. Abraham did that. I'm going to take steps to make sure that what God says happens. So I'll, I'll take my wife's servant and I'll have a son by her. Not that you or I have ever done anything to help God out. We walk by faith, not by sight. And I will tell you, that's much harder to do than it is to say. That's much harder to live than it is to stand up and, and raise your hand. But that last verse blows me away. The royal uh, go, Jesus said, your son will live. And so the man took Jesus at his word and departed. After all of that, you're not going to believe unless you see a sign and a wonder. After that, he actually Believe. He took Jesus at his word. How hard that must have been for him. Jesus had challenged him, and as it turned out, no. He didn't need a sign in order to believe. He took Jesus at his word. He took him on faith, and he went back home. What about me? What about you. Do we act on God's promises? Or do we hedge our bets and wait and see if God's promises might happen in this instance? Harsh. That's harsh. But that, that, I can't look at you and say that. Every time I ask that question, I have to look at me. What am I doing? Verse 51. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, Yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Now, I don't think it says that in Greek. Eric, would you check that for me? I think it says, well, maybe it may have said one in the afternoon. But there's a reason I want to get to this. Then the father realized this was the exact time that Jesus said to him, Your son will live. And so his whole household believed. And let's finish with this. This was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea into Galilee. The reason I'm wondering if that's what it says in the Greek is because usually in the New Testament, in Roman thinking, they're not that precise. At one in the afternoon, they may have said in the second hour, the second uh, watch, or they may have said some other thing in the afternoon. But usually they didn't say 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. And as a matter of fact, it would say he was healed at that very hour. And for the Romans, wow, really? That very hour? For you and I, he was healed at that very microsecond. See, it's just a matter of, of a different cultural way of thinking about things. Wow, that quick at that very hour? Okay, that, enough beating that horse because it really doesn't mean anything other than a cultural difference. But God answers prayers. Sometimes he says yes. 
Sometimes he says no, and sometimes he says wait. I take that back. Most times he says wait. Because, here's how I think about it. When God tells me he wants me to do something, or that he has something for me, oftentimes I'm not prepared for that yet. He's told me what he's going to do, but now he has to prepare me for when the fullness of time comes. But that's not how we think. When God tells me, I'm going to do this for you, okay, let's go right now. And yet, again, scripturally, that's not the way it works. Jesus told us God knows what you need before you even ask him. Right? So why bother asking? Because he tells you to. Don't bother trying to figure out how prayer works. Don't don't put together a schematic and you know, God's power this way and versus the dynamics of your situation that. Don't do that. It's not going to work. Don't try to figure out how prayer works. Pray. As a matter of fact, I think the fact that God knows what you need, but he wants you to pray anyway, is a matter of just in building a relationship. It has nothing to do with cause and effect. It just has to do with trust me, ask me, seek me. God knows, he hears, he answers. But here is how God works. The boy was healed when the father asked. But the father didn't know he'd been healed until after he'd acted in faith. He didn't find out until the next day. And I find that God works that way. That's, that's perfectly in line and normal with what God does. And so because the father believed, he then had influence on other people. And others in Herod's household believed because of what happened to him. Now look at the progression. Uh, let me go back there in mind so I can see that. Uh, verse 53, then the father realized that this was the exact time at which, I think it were there, it says exact hour, or at the hour at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. Verse 54. This is the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. So look at the progression. Jesus is, he left Judea and he's going back to Galilee. First, he spends time with a prostitute and leads people to believe. Next, he goes, spends time with a royal official of the Jews, in one way or another. Anybody can believe in God. Anybody can be useful to God. A prostitute, a royal official. That's, you got some extremes going here. And the picture is, God can use. And so it says, this is the second sign. Is that another sign? What, what do you mean sign? This is like spur of the moment. He's doing something else in Cana, and this guy comes and interrupts and says, heal my son. And Jesus doesn't even do anything big deal about it. He just, go your way, your son's healed. But John says, this is the second sign. It's important. It's powerful. Jesus didn't even go to Capernaum. But God set that as a sign for people to believe. And people did. What about you? You know, it's really funny. We pray about something. We seek something. God answers that prayer. And we might remember to mention it in the prayer request of the praise. But it's just, we agonize and we, oh no, God, I really need this. Please bless me and take care of this. And God does. And a week later, we don't even, yeah, don't even think about it anymore. Human nature is so bizarre. But what about me? Do I trust God? Yes. Is it easy? No. Do I feel better trusting God? 
Somebody once asked C.S. Lewis, which is which religion gives the most comfort? He said, if you're seeking comfort, I don't recommend Christianity. He says a bottle of wine will make you happier. <laughs> if you want reality, seek God. So, you know, what? why am I going to God? So I can just get what I want? Or because this is what I need? This is what I was created for. This is who my creator is. It's a matter of getting our priorities straight. And so today, the message is trust God. Even when it doesn't... What do you mean my son's going to be healed? Trust God. And that man did. You know, the other guy, I do believe, helped my unbelief. But this guy, he took Jesus at his word. And that's powerful to me. And the second part of that is, of the message is, God can use anyone. Can he use you and me? Let's pray. Father, I do believe. Help my unbelief. I want to take you at your word. Strengthen me. Lord, glorify yourself to what you do in our lives. Help us. Just hang on tight when it seems like the storm is tossing all around us and threatening to tear everything apart. Be God and help us to trust. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.